Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart are two of the hottest young stars in Hollywood today. While their roles in the massively popular Twilight Saga have propelled them to superstar status, they have also proved to be very accomplished and versatile actors outside of the franchise. In films such as Adventureland, The Runaways, Water for Elephants, and Cosmopolis. However, it's not just their on-screen appeal that has captured the attention of fans and media alike. Their off-screen romance that mirrored Twilight's Bella and Edward has had everyone talking. Affectionately known to their fans as R. Pats and K. Stew, their rise to fame has been mesmeric. However, it has been their sometimes secret, sometimes public relationship that has teased fans for over four years never confirming or denying anything until their very public breakup in summer 2012. While it may be unclear if the pair will remain apart or get back together, the future for these two A-list stars will continue to sparkle. It was obvious to the outside world that they were together or it was only going to be a matter of time. People couldn't wait to see them kiss on screen. They couldn't wait to see the love scene. It just really put a lot of pressure on their relationship. Kristen and Robert Patterson's chemistry was obviously electric. From the minute he walked in the room, it was almost like eyes across a dance floor. It was one of the best marketing tools Twilight ever had, that in real life they got together, because it was real. You knew that the on-set chemistry wasn't forced, and you could get swept away in it because they were in love. There's nothing quite like a good Hollywood love story. And for Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart, stars of the hit vampire series Twilight, their on-screen romance as star-crossed lovers Bella and Edward translated to an off-screen affair that captured the hearts of their adoring fans. But before the pair even set eyes on each other, they were carving out careers for themselves in their own right. Kristen Stewart, it seemed, was destined to go into the film or television industry from an early age. Born in Los Angeles, California in 1990 to Mother Jules and Father John, her initial interests were not solely based on acting. Acting was a very natural fit for Kristen. Her mom was a script supervisor, her father a stage manager, so she was in the biz from birth, pretty much. With two parents in the film industry, it was no great surprise that Kristen wanted to be in that industry. She had always envisaged herself perhaps as a script writer, but it was acting that she really showed this raw talent for. Kristen started acting after an agent spotted her in a Christmas play when she was eight years old. It wasn't ever something that I like sought after or you know made a conscious decision, this is what I want to do, I want to be an actress. Um, I was forced to be in a play because everyone had to participate in like the fourth grade and um, there was an agent in the audience and he uh, just asked if we wanted representation. And then she went on to do movie roles and she had a very fun part in the Flintstones Viva Rock Vegas and she did a Disney movie so her career really took off very early. She was very fortunate to land these roles at such a young age. So she started auditioning for things. She got her big break in this small indie film called The Safety of Objects. She started alongside um, Glenn Close, um, Joshua Jackson, as we know, it's from Dawson's Creek and Fringe right now. Um, and she played um, the daughter of Patricia Clarkson. So that was like her film debut. Aged just 11 years old, Kristen's role in The Safety of Objects put her on a more unconventional path for a child star. With a plot revolving around the intertwining lives of four suburban families, she played tomboy Sam, who is kidnapped by a local workman. Her largest role to date, it would prove to be not only a challenge for the young star, but also a strong indication of the path she wanted her career to take. Here we saw a girl who didn't really want to be shackled by the term child star. And the way she looked, the way she acted, you could tell from the start there was something a little bit more edgy about her. What are you doing? Um, I just calling my mom to um, say hi. Any luck? 
Oh, I was just about to die. Kristen, obviously, from an early age, had a dark side or was interested in a much more independent role where she could be a little bit more of a tortured soul. She definitely wasn't a Disney child. She wasn't like Lindsay Lohan doing the more um, childish roles where she'd be all singing, all dancing, really chilled out, having fun. She played a tomboy in the safety of objects. It really showed that she had range and she wasn't just going to be another bubbly young actress desperate for fame. I think Kristen actually did things in the right order, really. When you are a child star, actually, sometimes it's best to go in easy rather than go in in a lead role. She sort of built up her career, really, and I guess she learned how to act. And then by the time she was in The Safety of Objects, actually, she'd had a little bit of experience, but again, had never had a leading role. While The Safety of Objects proved to be a respected independent movie offering, it was clear for the young Kristen that her career was starting to gather pace and her next project would provide her mainstream breakthrough. Robert Pattinson's route into acting took a very different course. Born in London, England in May 1986 to Richard and Claire Pattinson, Rob's good looks from an early age certainly got him noticed. Robert started his career as a male model because his mother ran a modeling agency and so he was clearly in the right place, right time. Rob's mother is was a model, so by the age of 12 he was already doing some modeling. It's obviously a very good looking guy. But you could just see from his face, he's got those amazing cheekbones, so he was definitely going to be someone who would turn into a heartthrob. Actually his modeling career wasn't a very successful one. He still actually to a certain extent has an androgynous appeal and in some ways if you look at pictures of him from that time, you know, I mean, he, he looks great, but he doesn't look particularly overtly masculine, and the career didn't really last that long because of that. It was obvious from the start that with that look, he was just going to go flying. But I don't think he really enjoyed it, so it was always going to have to develop into acting, singing, some other form of the showbiz industry. Modelling clearly wasn't the way forward for Rob, as while his androgynous look had been popular during the late 90s, tastes changed and work dried up, forcing the teenager with the striking features to turn his attention elsewhere with the encouragement of another family member. His dad actually is the one who was kind of pushing him towards being an actor. At one point, even offered to pay Rob uh, to start kind of taking acting seriously and studying it because his dad clearly saw that his son had some talent. The way that Rob tells it is that he and his father were out in Barnes, the suburb in London that he comes from, and they saw a group of pretty girls, and they'd been to local acting classes. And so his father said to Rob, well, look, why don't you go as well? And Rob thought, great idea, because he'd meet nice girls. That's how it all began. While Rob explored the world of amateur dramatics, he was unaware of the path to superstardom that lay before him and that his big break was just around the corner. Back in the US, Kristen was forging ahead, carving out a very respectable acting career for someone so young. Following her tentative steps into film roles, she landed a part opposite Hollywood icon Jodie Foster in David Fincher's thriller Panic Room. She wasn't the typical Hollywood it girl. She really had a lot of depth. She could play brooding and moody. And one of the roles that really kind of put her on the map that let everyone see how talented she was, was The Panic Room with Jodie Foster. There she was acting against one of Hollywood's biggest heavyweights. And she really did an amazing job. And actually a lot of people didn't even know she was a girl. <laughs> she pulled the tomboy thing so well, uh, people thought she was a little boy. Rubber Soul. Yesterday and today, Magical Mystery Tour, The White Album. Stay warm, baby. Stay warm. Panic Room really was the breakthrough moment for Christian Stewart's acting career. It was a very big movie at the time, obviously an adult film, quite dramatic content as well. But the most significant thing really is that it was a film that had a very limited cast. Obviously it was all based around the headliner Jodie Foster, but she was really right in there. I mean, Christian was a very significant part of the film, so it was the first time that Kristen got to display real acting chops, I guess. And it was great that she was working opposite Jodie Foster because Kristen, in a lot of ways, is like a young Jodie Foster. They both can play these tomboys very well. They both do Moody exceptionally well. And uh, it was a nice fit. 
Jodie's remained a real role model to her. She started as one of her big influences in Hollywood and has really remained important in her life and her career to this date. And it was very interesting in more recent times when Kristen's affair with her director was revealed, actually the only person in Hollywood who was prepared to go on the record and publicly defend her was Jodie Foster. I often wonder if that's where she started to think, I want to really push the boundaries and looked at Jodie as an idol. But they acted together and can you imagine the overwhelming fear of having somebody, a great actor like that, and having to match them. Her, her role, Kristen's role in The Panic Room was a tomboy but also very confident. And I think if you can pull that off age 12 alongside Jodie Foster, then you know that you're going to nail it as an actor later in life. And Jodie Foster even said at the time that, you know, she was one of those actresses who wasn't like any other actors, like she had a different method to her acting and that like she was very stoic and kept everything wrapped in and very similar to Jodie Foster herself. Sergeant Pepper. Oh, Dad? Dad? One of the most important aspects of this film was that it was very dark in nature. I mean, we have Jodie Foster, David Fincher. They're known for very gritty roles, and they brought Kristen into the fold, and she did really well. That's when people took notice, and they thought, hey, this kid can act. She's very good. In the panic room when Kristen worked with the director, David Fincher, that gave her a taste of what it was like to work with somebody who enjoyed working in dark films like Seven. And we're all very easily influenced around that age, 12, early teens. And here she is working with this man and her eyes have been opened to the fact it's not all Disney movies out there in the Flintstones. She can really maybe have a, a great career in portraying the darker characters, which we now know she's so good that. Panic Room was Kristen's big break, not only offering her box office success, but also critical acclaim for her role, as she was nominated for a Young Artist Award. Not one to rest on her laurels, Stewart moved quickly on to 2003's Cold Creek Manor, another thriller in which she played the daughter of Dennis Quaid and Sharon Stone. Dark films were seemingly a trend for the youngster. Kristen Stewart made really brave choices actually as a young actress. I mean, obviously, first big role, Panic Room, and then she went on to a film called Cold Creek Manor. It was a popular film, but not a big blockbuster and something which didn't appeal to her age group. So what she avoided doing was trying to seek out a teenage film. People may not realize this, but she wasn't even a teenager yet when she got Cold Creek Manor, and she was actually nominated for a Young Artist Award. So if that doesn't give her a lot of cred in the business, I don't know what does. Maintaining her run of darkly themed and challenging films, 2004 saw Kristen appear in the made-for-TV movie Speak, playing a rape victim who loses the power to verbally communicate. Receiving praise for her performance, the film also offered Stuart her first leading role. In 2004, she started in this amazing TV movie called Speak. She played a young rape victim who loses the ability to speak after the attack. It really showed how brave Kristen is because a lot of young up-and-coming starlets wouldn't have taken the role because they would have been afraid it would ruin their chances of landing that big screen comedy or that silly family film. But also, it must have been a pretty tough decision on her parents. Do we allow our 13-year-old to go down this route where so it's so emotive for her. Can she handle it at such a young age? Well, the critics decided she could handle it because she was absolutely magnificent in the role. And again, her versatility was proven. I think if you're looking for credibility in Hollywood in the future, it really pays if you're a child star to make some bold decisions relatively early in your career. So we've seen it with Jennifer Lawrence who moved on from quite a dark art house movie like Winter's Bone into the Hunger Games. The same thing really was applicable to Kristen because her pre-Twilight career really didn't feature any of those big mainstream blockbusters. Some of her films were big, but they weren't easy choices. And always they were based around, I guess, challenging acting too. As Kristen moved from strength to strength in her burgeoning career, Robert Pattinson was just about to embark on his journey to the top. Following his introduction to acting, he started to make some minor inroads into the industry. An appearance in Ring of Nibelungs, a made-for-TV fantasy movie, was followed by a much more significant role in 2004's adaptation of Vanity Fair, where he played opposite Reese Witherspoon. Unfortunately for the aspiring actor, 
his scenes were left on the cutting room floor. Rob's career appeared to be stalling, as although other small jobs came in, he ended up being fired just before opening night from stage play The Woman Before. It was then that his luck changed as Pattinson landed the coveted role of tragic hero Cedric Diggory in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. When Robert took the role of Cedric in uh, The Goblet of Fire, we all kind of went, who's this guy? You know, the look that he had immediately just made, like dragged you in. When director Mike Newell of The Goblet of Fire first met Robert Pattinson, he knew right away that he was perfect for the role of Cedric Diggory. He said he had this perfect English, preppy, good boy looks that was what was needed for the role. Playing Cedric Diggory in Harry Potter was just dynamite for Robert Pattinson. Who are you? What do you want? Because he was heroic, he had a good heart, but ultimately perhaps more memorable because he had a tragic end. So he was this person who really gave up his own life for a greater good. Thanks. No problem. Uh, for a moment there I thought you, you were going to let it get me. For a moment so did I. So for fans of the Harry Potter books, by virtue of the fact that he was Cedric already kind of meant he was a heartthrob. And they wanted someone who had kind of these brooding good looks that girls would react to, and they certainly did. I remember when I was watching that film, and you do notice him, he has got this screen presence, and you do think, hang on, is this right that I'm starting to fancy someone in Harry Potter? It's probably not, but that's how people started to notice him. Rob took the initiative following his success in Harry Potter and moved out to Los Angeles, where he got an agent and began looking for bigger roles. Yet, it seemed as though his career had stalled. There was actually a rather strange fallow period after the Harry Potter films. He did acquire an LA agent. He also did a little bit of indie work, but he didn't actually do very much. So he actually spent the best part of a year mooching around in LA, playing his guitar, playing his, his music, hanging out, having no doubt a great time of it. But at the same time, you have to strike while the iron is hot. And having made his mark in Harry Potter, had he not moved fairly quickly or had other people not moved fairly quickly, you know, he really might have blown it for good. Kristen was not experiencing anything close to a hiatus in her career as it began to gather pace rapidly. Following her run of distinctly darker independent films, she dipped her toes into more mainstream fare with 2004's Catch That Kid. Kristen showed a talent for a darker side in films, but then call it a rite of passage, call it just doing what scripts came in that day, she went for the obvious roles to like catch that kid, which was a bit like Spy Kids, kind of panned, but other critics saw it as something that was quite fun. And, you know, you're a young girl, why not take on those roles too? And actually it shows how versatile you are when you can go from being the boisterous tomboy and taking on the darker roles to being the, the characters that kids love. I'm gonna distract them when I give you guys the signal, go up the stairs and get into the elevator. I'll meet you there. Catch That Kid in 2004 was relatively significant in the development of Kristen's career. She was the main star of the film. It was also still not quite a typical teenage movie because it was actually based on a 12-year-old bank robber and that's who she played. So obviously some of the content potentially morally questionable. But I guess it was the first time that she maybe stepped up a little bit and didn't play a supporting role. She was actually the lead role. What are you doing? I have the money for the operation, Dad. We're going to Denmark. What are you talking about? I got the money! After that, in 2005, she did Zathora which is also a family-friendly uh, movie. It was based on a book by the author of Jumanji. It's a fantasy adventure movie about um, this family, it's these two boys, these brothers, who help play a game and get sent up into space, and it's about them trying to get back. Um, it's, it's cool, too, because it's like a... It's, it's a very family-oriented movie. And, that, and what's funny is that she starred alongside Josh Hutcherson, who is now playing PETA on another Twilight-like um, franchise, The Hunger Games. So that was her fair into um, family-friendly movies, um, things that were more mainstream. While Catch That Kid and Zathura didn't perform well at the box office, Kristen had alerted Hollywood to her quality and versatility, and her prolific early career continued at pace. 
In her mid-teenage years, Kristen did get to the point where actually Hollywood was starting to take notice. So she started to get roles in films which were potential blockbusters. None of them really exploded, but the point is they could have. She was cast in The Messengers, which was a horror film, and then she also starred alongside Meg Ryan, actually, in In the Land of Woman. Going back to her roots and appearing in low-budget independent films suited Kristen. With several other projects completed or in production, she went on to appear in two films that would break new ground for her as a growing screen presence. Into the Wild, which told the story of Christopher McCandless's hike into the Alaskan wilderness, and comedy drama Adventureland, where she played opposite Jesse Eisenberg as his flawed and complicated love interest. Next up for Kristen was Into the Wild and Adventureland, two very different movies, but she played edgy people in both of them. Um, she played women who were emotionally damaged or made bad choices. So again, it showed her range and that she could kind of take on any role and make it her own. You selling these books? I am. We are. He was. When Kristen took on the role in Into the Wild, which was quite a small indie film, she has not the leading lady part, but you could see that she wasn't content with being the child star only. She wanted to show her versatility. I play a girl named Tracy. Um, and the story, I mean, it's, there's one central story, but it's sort of made up of like various different vignettes. I mean, it's about the people that he meets along the way, um, not just the track that he takes. Uh, and I play a girl he meets um, who is totally and completely enamored with him. And uh, I, have, I have sort of a bittersweet, like, kind of heartbreaking story. My parents went into town. No. Yeah. They went to call my grandma for Christmas. No, I mean, we can't do that. Why not? That was a perfect example of her following in the path to so many great actors who don't necessarily take the big bucks roles. They want to do something that shows off their, their acting ability. And that's what she seems determined to do. For an independent film, 2007's Into the Wild, directed by Sean Penn, was a large box office success. And while only playing a minor character in the film, it allowed Kristen to be seen by a wider and older audience. Then she also started in this film called Adventureland, where she played like this troubled teen girl who had an affair with an older man. So it was definitely like a role that wasn't, you know, normal for a young actress of like of her talent. It's a teen movie, but it's so not you know, it's not it's not what you usually get when, when you get scripts that are like teen movies. Um, and I'm, you know, that age, so it's nice to not have to play older to get something like beefy. It's like, you know. Often the roles that Kristen says yes to show a damaged person, sometimes with a real ability and and want to self-destruct. Who knows, perhaps that is in her anyway, that's in her makeup and that's why she's so good at it. Certainly she plays the roles very well. How did you, what do you, how did you find me here? What it really did, these roles, is it meant that she had a full plethora of experience before she finally got her big break, which obviously would come very, very soon after that playing Bella in Twilight. For both Rob Pattinson and Kristen Stewart, their next career moves saw them cemented in history as a classic on-screen pairing and globally recognised off-screen couple. In 2007, it was announced that the hugely popular Twilight series of books by Stephanie Meyer was to be made into a movie franchise. Having already established a huge fan base, speculation was rife as to whom would play the coveted roles of 108-year-old vampire Edward and lead heroine, 17-year-old Bella Swan. For director Catherine Hardwick, there was only one choice in her mind for the feisty, emotional and stubborn character of Bella, and that was Kristen Stewart. Obviously getting Twilight, that was the big break for Kristen Stewart, and actually it really feels like, bizarrely, because obviously she had no idea, but it really feels like all of her portfolios of movies in the past had, had prepared her for that role. Anyone that followed Kristen's career up until right before Twilight 
wouldn't be that surprised that she landed the role. Katherine Hardwick came to the set of Adventureland to screen test her, and she was looking for someone who could show a mixture of innocence, also a bit of budding sexuality, and she found that in Kristen. Katherine Hardwick loved what she saw when she turned up to the filming of Adventureland to watch Kristen on the set. Not only was she able to put in a stellar performance, but she'd worked a whole day, this young girl, and was able to switch off into something entirely different and audition as Bella. Catherine loved this because it showed a real maturity and depth, this young girl who could be very professional and she liked what she saw. I feel like everybody who reads the book sort of projects themselves onto Bella. You experience the whole story through her eyes. She has sort of innately really awesome female qualities. She really trusts herself and like goes with gut instincts and doesn't really get too caught up in the head. Um, she's strong, man. Despite a perfect background to play Bella, there were some fans, you know, diehard fans of the book who were a little unsure of whether she was the right Bella, but they couldn't argue the fact that of all the three main characters, she had the most acting experience and was most likely to get the job done. With Kristen now cast, the search was on for her love interest, the handsome and mysterious Edward Cullen. Edward Cullen, for me, when you're reading a book, is somebody who's obviously highly intelligent. He's been around for hundreds of years. He's got to be good looking. He's very mysterious. He's really thoughtful. He isn't the typical vampire that wants to go, you know, biting people and just killing everything. He's a good guy. So when they cast that film, they had to look for exactly the right guy. We wanted a guy that you could really relate to and that you could actually have a lot of compassion for. Having been mostly unemployed since his turn in Harry Potter, the now 21-year-old Robert Pattinson thought he'd take a shot at the role. The casting for Twilight was incredibly difficult. I know Catherine Hardwick, the director of the first movie, she, she I think she did about 5,000 screen tests for the role of Edward Cullen. And for Robert, he lucked out really because he came at the end of this massive search. The director just didn't have a clue. He went in and did the reading and apparently, according to Kristen Stewart, just blew away all the other candidates for the role. He came in and it did a very serious interpretation of Edward Cullen. He went into the casting with Kristen Stewart and Catherine Hardwick said the chemistry was unbelievable and I just knew I'd found the right guy. The final hurdle for Rob was a screen test at the home of the director, Catherine Hardwick, where he improvised scenes on her bed with Kristen. Not only was their connection palpable, but thanks to Hardwick's trust in her lead actress, Stuart had a big say in who would be Edward to her Bella. When Kristen screen tested with Robert Pattinson, there was an amazing chemistry there. Now I think given 90% of women on the planet would be delighted if they had to share a bed with Robert, of course they would, but the difference here was he was as delighted to be with her. Kristen was very keen for Rob to get the role and she did have some say in the matter. For his part, Rob clearly fancied her right from the word go. I mean, he made, he made jokes about sort of, you know, the attraction that he felt immediately. I think it was a little bit longer before she began to feel something in return. And the sparks were there. The director said that their bodies fitted perfectly together when they were lying on bed but right from the outset it was obvious that they were going to work well together. While all involved in the casting were pleased with their choices for Bella and Edward, fan reaction was scathing. You know, Rob being cast as the role of Edward Cullen was not a popular decision with fans. I think, you know, Rob himself said they had this, fans had this image of this kind of Viking king, you know, of the, of the vampires with this blonde Nordic looks, and that's really not how he looks. I think Stephanie Meyer did it, said it, but she, she wrote it for herself. And so uh, I think when you read it, it seems, it seems like it, it wasn't supposed to be published. And it's like something incredibly intimate and personal about it. And I think people really feel like they know the characters. I think that's what it is. The fan base was massive. And anyone reading a book, you're always going to have your own idea of who you think that person is, particularly when the guy, Edward Cullen, has been described as the most beautiful creature on the planet. I mean, how do you live up to something like that? Some fans were so angry that they created websites to try to stop him from being awarded the role of Edward Cullen, because Edward was already a romantic hero because of the, the books. Um, they were absolutely livid. I mean, the same fans who went on to absolutely idolize him really were, were campaigning against him. Um, his mother said that she found it very difficult to take, because all this sort of negative stuff was coming out, out about her son. 
Even producers at the studio asked Stephanie Meyer, hey, do you think this guy's the right guy? Um, they cautioned Catherine Hardwick's choice of casting him. They didn't think that he could be handsome enough. For Robert's part, you know, he was a little hesitant about even auditioning for the role. Of course, he wanted to have a movie gig, but he also was unsure of whether he could pull off this beautiful, perfect creature that was described in the books. He really made the role his own. Rob worked so hard to get this right. In fact, he actually moved to Oregon several months before filming started to kind of throw himself into the role and to make sure that when they actually began shooting, he was ready to go. He read all the books, he studied the text, he worked with Kristen and Stephanie Meyer to kind of figure out the vision of Edward, and you know, he nailed it. But sure enough, um, even before the movie launched, um, he landed Entertainment Weekly covers. People loved him. He looked good in them. Um, then fans started to believe that Robert could be Edward. This is what I am. And the fans who doubted the casting were soon eating their words, as Twilight was released in November 2008, proving to be a huge box office smash, garnering the principal leads with nominations for numerous awards. Twilight blew everyone away. They thought Kristen was fantastic, Edward was fantastic, and I think the reason everyone loved the movie so much was because of the chemistry between Edward and Bella. You were gone. Yeah, um, I was out of town for a couple of days, personal reasons. <laughs> Profase. You really bought it. You really thought of her as this lovelorn teenager who fell for this vampire as incredulous as it sounds. So they, they really pulled it off. The huge success built on the ever-growing hype surrounding Twilight instantly propelled both Kristen and Rob to superstardom at maximum speed. For the serial teen indie queen Kristen and the relatively unknown Pattinson, fame on a large scale was a lot to take. Kristen wasn't quite prepared for the onslaught of fame. Of course, she was excited to have the role, and she wanted this to really jumpstart her career into bigger and better things. But it really all came crashing down on that entire cast in an instant. And it was hard at first. You could tell she was very awkward on the red carpet. Her interviews were a little awkward as well. So it took a while for her to kind of feel comfortable being this superstar everyone wanted her to be. I don't think Robert enjoyed that side of fame at all. Twilight was obviously going to be the project that he needed career-wise to launch him, but I think the more and more that it went on and the more that you read his interviews, um, there was a brilliant one for Vanity Fair where you just read it and you just thought, God, this guy's hating every moment of his life right now. It's weird. I mean, it does. It reminds me of, like, the last time I was here was with the Goblet of Fire. And it was a similar experience. It's so strange. And I've seen... I used to live really close here and I've seen plenty of premieres. They never... No one's ever screaming like this. It's so weird. You know, he didn't want to be thrown into all of that. He didn't want to be in the tabloids. He didn't want to be on the front of the National Enquirer. He didn't want people talking about his sex life. And all of that was happening at one go. And it's a massive deal for someone to have to deal with going from zero to a billion in a second. But the glare of the spotlight was fixed firmly on the two new stars. And as their fans cooed and swooned over Bella and Edward's romantic tension, there were soon rumours that the fictional romance was fast becoming reality. The chemistry between Christian and Rob Patterson was going to be crucial for the success of the Twilight films. And they did have an instant chemistry that was obvious to everyone who was working on the movies and also it was obvious when you saw it on screen too. When they first started filming Twilight, both Robert and Christian had boyfriend-girlfriend. So it wasn't as if they could come together straight away even though the chemistry was there. And I think it must have been pretty awkward for their other halves to watch because it was obvious, it was obvious to the outside world who everyone was rumouring that they were together or it was only going to be a matter of time. But I think most people assumed that probably it was likely Robert and Christian would end up in a relationship at some point and that is obviously what did happen. It is unclear when they got together actually because no one has ever said but people began dropping hints. The director of the first films began making it clear that they were actually a couple. They began to be seen together but neither of them would confirm it for years and years and years. But Rob had to put in the groundwork because she wasn't free at the start. 
and they never ever confirmed that they were together. It's, it's really only been in the last year or so that they have been really quite openly a couple together. They seem to relax into it. They were getting very serious about one another, but Rob has been serious about her right from the beginning. It was she who had to be one round. But they were very, very secretive about it, fiercely private, which seems surprising in a way because the fans would have loved it even more if they'd come out and been open about the fact that they were dating. But perhaps because of the fans, they knew they had to hide, otherwise they'd just never get a moment to themselves. But I think that it was one of the best marketing tools Twilight ever had. That in real life they got together because it was real. You knew that the on-set chemistry wasn't forced and you could get swept away in it because they were in love. This happens a lot on movie sets. I mean, we've seen it with so many high-profile couples. But I think particularly when you're teenagers and you're at that age where you're likely to start getting your first serious boyfriend or girlfriend, it was going to be pretty hard for them to resist each other. And so, while never fully confirming their relationship, fans and media were sure they were witnessing the beginning of another great Hollywood love story. There was little waiting time following the huge success of Twilight before its follow-up, New Moon, started the cycle again. However, this time, there was competition for Rob's Edward and a new man in Kristen's life, as the character of Jacob Black was brought to the fore. Having had a smaller role in the original film, Taylor Lautner had to fight to retain his part by working on his physique in order for it to be in keeping with Jacob's description in the book. Now, the Twilight Saga had two heartthrobs, and with the story developing to include Jacob as a love interest for Bella, Kristen had two leading men. In the second installment of the series, New Moon, it was clear that the storyline was more about Kristen and Taylor, or I should say, Bella and Jacob, and their budding relationship. Bella! Where the hell have you been, Loka? This was interesting because the rumor was that her and Robert were together. So you thought, I wonder how he's handling that. But then suddenly you had Taylor who transformed. He was buff. And you kind of left the first film thinking, no comparison, you go for Robert every time. But then you thought, oh, hold on, here's a guy who looks amazing. His body's wonderful. He's really come into his own. New Moon is really Taylor's movie. I mean, he's the leading man of that film. Rob Pattinson has a much smaller role because in the book, Edward is away for most of that book. And that, in that movie, Taylor really comes into his own as a leading man. When you look at Taylor in the first Twilight film, I mean, the character of Jacob has less presence anyway than in the next film, but you really can't see that the character of Bella would fancy him. So when you saw the transformation in New Moon, he takes his top off, I remember hearing gasps in the cinema because they just didn't think this was the same guy. What happened to you? What's wrong? Hey, what happened? And I do think, actually, that there was chemistry there. Maybe not the chemistry there was with Robert, but there was chemistry there. But more importantly, it was realistic. You thought, actually, maybe you could be torn between these two guys, because Robert and Taylor are very different looking, really different personalities in the film. And you could see how she might be torn. However, the on-screen relationship between Bella and Jacob led fans to assume that Kristen's relationship with Rob was in jeopardy, and she was now dating Taylor Lautner. When New Moon came out, everyone obviously thought that there must be something going on between Christian and Taylor. And there were loads of rumours and reports that Rob was really unhappy about their kissing scenes and that there was jealousy between the two of them. I never really bought that because the thing about Robert and Christian is they are pretty comfortable in themselves. Taylor was obviously turning into one of the most eligible bachelors in Hollywood anyway, and that always all got on pretty well. Well, Kristen and Taylor have a fantastic relationship off screen. They're really good friends. They're really natural and easy with each other. They are like brother and sister, and they have been really from the first movie. So for Kristen and Taylor, I think their on screen chemistry really mirrored what they have in real life. Kristen has said that, you know, she feels incredibly comfortable with him as he does with her. They consider each other amongst their closest friends. I convinced you to build two-wheeled death machines with me. Don't you think that makes you kind of young and naive? Okay, so where do we stand? 
So I think with Kristen and Taylor, their on-screen chemistry was really good, but it's a platonic, for the most part, relationship. You know, there are, I mean, he's in love with her in a way, and I think she has confusion about her feelings for him, but you know, Bella never really loves Jacob the way she loves Edward. And it's kind of like that in real life as well. I think Kristen really loves Taylor as a friend. Despite the rumors, Kristen and Taylor were simply co-stars and good friends. New Moon broke further box office records on its release in November 2009. And while a lot of the talk surrounding the film was focused on Bella and Jacob's relationship, the spotlight never really wavered from the pairing of Kristen and Rob and their growing love for one another. With intense media attention on not only their personal lives, but also their careers, both Rob and Kristen looked to take a step away from Twilight, so as not to be tied too heavily to the franchise that had brought them to this level of fame. For Rob, it was the low-budget, romantic coming-of-age drama Remember Me, where he played opposite Pierce Brosnan as Tyler Hawkins, a directionless 21-year-old who falls for the daughter of Chris Cooper. His involvement in this project also gave a strong indication of areas he may wish to explore further in his career. Of course, the fame keeps building and building with each film. By New Moon, uh, the main characters can't go anywhere without being bombarded. I mean, he has girls coming up to him asking him if he'd bite them. <laughs> so his life is completely different than he ever imagined it would be. But he still wants to, you know, explore different roles and try different things. And he took a role in a movie called Remember Me. He actually starred in it and he produced it, which says a lot about an actor in Hollywood. This is the sign that he is looking for a much bigger career than we've seen so far. Rob knows that the Twilight franchise is coming to an end and he knows he's got to establish himself as a serious player in Hollywood quickly. A lot of actors do try and become either directors or producers with, with varying degrees of success. He's actually starting pretty young. I mean, he's only 26. But he's aware that Hollywood is a fickle place and he's got to start acting now. I read the script after, after the first one and, you know, I've always, I'm always quite attracted to sort of, you know, like angsty, uh, yeah, sort of tormented, like fraught characters. But I mean, I don't know, because I, I wouldn't have thought of myself as being particularly fraught and angsty. Whatever the influences on him might have been, I would say his actual charm is completely unique. Um, he manages to convey a kind of soulfulness and an intensity, which is exactly what that role requires. It was clear that he wanted to establish himself as a, a, a very different kind of, kind of more indie actor, so not, not one that's going to be part of this blockbuster series. But he's also said that he was lucky in a way because he had a bit of a, a safety net with Twilight because you'd have you know, three or four months in between the filming, you could go and do a, a kind of real low budget, daring movie and still come back to Twilight and know that you're gonna be all right. While Remember Me's success proved that Rob was a big box office draw as a leading man in his own right, Kristen undertook a much more daring role. Going back to her low-budget indie roots, she played punk rock icon Joan Jett in The Runaways, a surprise for many Twilight fans given the adult nature of the part. In the midst of filming all of the Twilight films, Kristen went out on a limb and she played Joan Jett in The Runaways. Now that's a completely different role than Bella. I mean, you couldn't find two more different characters, but she was really intrigued by that. And I think that's what she liked about it. She just didn't want to be Bella. And she was on her way to just being Bella in everyone's eyes. I think it's safe to say that Kristen definitely didn't want to be typecast as just the Twilight hottie that hung off our pants. And um, obviously she was in the Runaways after Twilight's her first film from coming out of the franchise, playing Joan Jett, she was like a rock chick. So she's showing again that she can do something completely different. So we're practicing a trailer in the valley. What probably happened there? Come find me. Kristen fitted the role of Joan Jett absolutely perfectly. I picture Kristen as being the girl, if you were at school with her, she'd be at the back of the class, kind of listening to her hard rock and classical rock. And you'd think, the guys would think, yeah, she's really pretty, but you know, she's always listening to her music. That's the girl she is. She had this amazing swagger and inner confidence and kind of this rebellious streak that fitted the role absolutely perfectly. Kristen even won praise from Joan herself, who was on hand during the production process to guide the Twilight star. Kristen had just been cast and uh, I was really excited about that because I, had, I was not, I didn't have any preconceived notions about Twilight or anything like that. And we got a chance to meet and I thought she was just a really authentic, 
real person who wanted to do the right thing with this role. And um, I, when I asked her if she was going to cut her hair, and she said, yeah. And I thought, you know, I, I, was, I felt good about it. She cut her hair really short, dyed it black. She even shared a kissing scene with Dakota Fanning. Um, and this was far, like a far, far stretch from her character of Bella Swan in Twilight. It's really easy for an actress who's trying to make a name for herself to kind of fall into one genre and stick with what she knows. It's easier that way. But that's never been Kristen's way of doing her job. She really wants to push herself and try different things. Following their break away from the series, Rob and Kristen were reunited on screen again for 2010's Eclipse. The third film in the franchise proved to be business as usual, breaking box office records and whipping the fans into a frenzy, this time with a focus mainly on which leading man Bella would choose. When Eclipse comes out, you really do have to make a choice. And I'm not talking about whether you go see the movie. Of course you're going to see the movie. I'm talking about whether you're Team Edward or Team Jacob. I think if you were Team Edward, then you knew that you were supporting a guy that was going to look after Bella, wrap her up in his arms, make sure nothing bad ever happened to her. Um, I think if you were with Team Jacob, then to begin with, it was about his muscles and about his torso and about the fact he was hot. And then at the end, you went, oh yeah, he's really aggressive and will really stand up for Bella. The difference in appearance and every part of the package of those two actors was really played on in the marketing campaign. Their dreams came true, really, because obviously in the book, people were either supporting Edward or they were supporting Jacob, but it just came to life even more on the posters and, you know, the whole campaign built around Twilight. Well, you can see Bella finally acknowledge that Jacob could offer her a whole lot and I mean, I know it's something that the audience has seen the entire time, but now she's finally like disarmed enough to see that, and I think it's really great because it makes the relationship between Edward and her so much more real because now she's like choosing him and not like in need of him. And as much as Twilight's awesome because it's like all about just throwing yourself into the like the unknown, this is now like a more adult love story, and it needs to progress there. I think Eclipse was obviously a brilliant film for Kristen, and she must have thought, "Do I really get paid for this?" She's got Edward on one side, Jacob on the other. They're both fighting for her love and she can just kind of stand there and think, which one do I want? By the end of Eclipse, Bella was finally ready to make her decision, leaving fans with a tantalising prospect of seeing their perfect off-screen couple finally get together on screen in Breaking Dawn. However, fans were forced to wait another year for this, and Rob was once again taking a step away from Twilight by appearing in the 1930s romantic drama Water for Elephants. Playing opposite Reese Witherspoon, it was a chance for him to see if he could hold down a romantic lead against Hollywood royalty and strike up a similar level of chemistry that he had with Kristen in Twilight. Water for Elephants really signified a huge crossroads for Robert. Can he cut it not just in Twilight, where yes, the role is huge, but you're turning up on set not just to look great and attract loads of teen um, girls, you're turning up to display your depth of character, uh, play a leading man in the traditional sense of the role when it's all about the acting. It was a big day, that last day of my final exam. I couldn't move fast enough. My life was finally going to start and I knew exactly where it was taking me. To be paired with Reese Witherspoon as her leading man, as her co-star, was a huge step up in the world for him, and must have been, he must have been absolutely over the moon when he was cast with Reese. Reese Witherspoon and Robert got together brilliantly in that film. It was exactly what you needed, and you can always tell when there's good chemistry because the magazines and everybody starts going, oh, what's going on, you know? Is Kristen and Rob all right? Because Reese is with him now in a film, and that's when you know that you've done a really good job. Out there, I got nothing. Just like everybody else. You're a beautiful woman. You deserve a beautiful life. That's all there is to it. In fact, they became very, very close friends, they had a fantastic relationship off camera, and when Rob fled Los Angeles very recently following the whole Kristen Stewart scandal, it said he actually went and hid out at Reese's Ojai Ranch in California, and she actually took him in as a friend and said, you know, come and stay there and get away from some of the paparazzi. So their friendship began really um, on that movie and has lasted since. 
2011 saw the beginning of the final chapter in the Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn Part 1. It was also the film that would finally give the Twihards that moment of passion from Bella and Edward, between real-life lovers Rob and Kristen, that they had been anticipating for so long. Breaking Dawn was definitely the film that all Twilight fans couldn't wait to arrive. It's the film where Edward and Bella have sex for the first time. She gets pregnant and then the baby, which is like half human, half vampire, is this possibility that she's going to die. And it's just such a great, great film. The roles that Kristen's chosen to take outside of Twilight really mirror her progression as a character in the films. Look at Breaking Dawn. There's more gravitas there, there's more mystery, there's more darkness, and you know ultimately there's going to be a conclusion and it might not all be all roses and flowers. And that's the way she's mirrored other roles she's taken on. Very astute, very clever, and she's played every role so well. It was hard for her, you know, it was basically the becoming a woman on stage. We've all seen her as this young actress and I think she handled it really well. It must have been really tough for her. It was a pretty depressing film for Bella from the beginning all the way through to the end, but also a film that most Twilight fans were looking forward to the most. By the time that Breaking Dawn Part 1 came out, everyone in the entire world knew that she and Robert Pattinson were a real couple. And so that made everything much more intense. People couldn't wait to see them kiss on screen. They couldn't wait to see the love scene from the book. And it just really put a lot of pressure, not just on the film, but on their relationship. You're so beautiful. books they manage to capture the first sexual experience with Bella and Edward perfectly and you do always think as a fan of a book how's this going to translate on screen how are they going to do it is it are they going to give it justice and I thought the whole scene where um, Bella's in the bathroom and she's panicking like any normal girl about to lose their virginity was just such a good scene it was really real to life and it wasn't like over dramatized or just like pushed to one side Breaking Dawn was a significant film because it was the first time that the saga became more adult and so the film is generally viewed as the time that they moved from being teenage actors into quite established adult actors. Breaking Dawn not only broke further box office records, becoming one of the highest grossing opening weekends of all time, but firmly established its principal casts as adult leads. And while there had still not been anything like a confirmation, the rumours regarding Rob and Kristen's relationship persisted with fervour. Between Twilight films, Kristen and Rob both undertook separate projects, placing them firmly in starring roles. For Kristen, it was a step into new territory in the high-budget, effects-laden blockbuster Snow White and the Huntsman. Snow White and the Huntsman was a big deal for Kristen's career. It was a big-budget film, it had huge stars in it, it was advertised all over the place, and so she had a lot riding on this because everyone wondered, can she be something other than Bella? Will she be as successful as she was playing Bella? And, you know, there were some mixed reviews, but a lot of people liked it. I thought it was a fantastic film. I don't think it showed her complete range, but it was definitely enjoyable. While Kristen had been working on Snow White, Rob had undertaken a new film, Cosmopolis, from David Cronenberg, and with the hype surrounding Breaking Dawn and its impending follow-up still very high, all seemed to be going well for the love-struck Hollywood couple. However, rumours soon surfaced that all was not well in their relationship, and when revealing photographs of Kristen with her Snow White and the Huntsman director, Rupert Sanders, appeared in the American press in May 2012, everything came crashing down. News came out that she had an affair with the director of Snow White and the Huntsman, who was married, Rupert Sanders. Um, Us Weekly got exclusive photos of them together, vacationing, kissing, embracing. You know, for people who are in the public eye, the photos were incredibly, um, well, they were just incredibly stupid. It was such bad judgment. And you would think that somebody like Kristen, who is, has been followed before by photographers, would be smarter. Because, you know, she and Rupert met up in a public park 
And, and you know, every time uh, somebody walked by, they would break away from each other. And then as soon as they thought they were alone, they would be all over each other making out. He was fondling her, embracing her. And then they get in a parked car and appear to be doing some possibly sexual acts, uh, kissing, but more than kissing on the lips. And, and this is all captured on film. Now, there's an interesting conspiracy theory about how this photographer got those pictures. According to Us Weekly, which bought the photos, uh, this photographer had been following Kristen and noticed that she was going to kind of a seedy part of town, thought it would be worth following her, ended up following her to this park where she met up with Rupert. There are other theories, however, that this in fact was done by a private investigator who may have been hired by perhaps, say, Rupert's wife or someone else associated with the group to actually follow her husband or perhaps uh, expose this affair. And a private investigator got the pictures and then those were sold to the magazine. Um, a lot of people, you know, that's just a theory, but a lot of people believe that someone must have had a tip off to happen to actually catch those two in the act. Of course, we'll never really know how he got those pictures, but we do know that they fetched over $300,000 uh, for those shots. They were explicit, they were obvious, and they were undeniable, which I can promise you, if they hadn't been so clear, both parties would have almost certainly lied and denied that anything had gone on because that's what celebrities do. Kristen Stewart's affair with Rupert Sanders was just like a blow, not just to Robert Pattinson, but you'd have thought she cheated on every single Twilight star in the entire world. I mean, they were mortified and upset and horrified, but none more than Kristen herself. Well, Kristen is said to have actually called up the photographer who took the pictures and begged him not to sell them, probably offered him money uh, as well, which he declined. Um, it's very ironic that this uh, thing played out so publicly, where there were even photographs of the betrayal because Rob and Kristen were so incredibly private. You know, they were living together, but most people didn't know that or didn't even know where they lived or how long they'd been living together. They had a dog together. They have a dog together called Bear. Again, a lot of this detail didn't come out until, you know, we saw him moving out of their home. She was hurt. She did something unheard of in Hollywood, which was to make a public apology for having an affair and cheating on someone she loved and disappointing everyone. So clearly she's very hurt by it and she's embarrassed by it. She actually came out with a statement, this really personal sounding statement. She apologized for indiscretion. She was sorry that she hurt Rob. She specifically said Rob. And she said that she loved him, loved him, loved him like three times over. Um, so it was pretty, it sounded like a pretty desperate call for an apology. It was groveling. She loved him. He was the most important thing in her life. She was so sorry. She feels like her life's over kind of thing. And this was the first admission in this four years of are they, aren't they together, the first admission that they were together. But how awful that the admission comes when you're breaking up and begging for forgiveness. But I was told Rob was actually irritated by the public apology because as he said, you know, she only had to phone two people, me and Rupert's wife. Uh, she didn't need to do that. In terms of how Rob reacted to this, he was said to be absolutely shocked and devastated. I've been told that Kristen called him and told him the news on the phone just before the magazine came out. Of course, her people had been alerted. They had called for comment. She knew it was coming out, so she'd wanted to warn him. And this was just after the Teen Choice Awards. You know, we saw them on stage that night. Their body language was a little bit stiff. Sources say they didn't sit together that night in the audience and backstage they were seen fighting and she seemed to be pleading with him. So there's some speculation that he might have known something, maybe not the extent of it, but something at that point. And then of course, it was only a couple days later that the story broke and everything was out. For someone like Robert, who's fiercely private, even though the press knew he was dating Kristen Stewart, he didn't talk about her. I mean, he'd say like one line in an interview just saying how great it was to work with her. Neither of them admitted it in public. And then to have to experience something that went worldwide was just devastating for him because it's suddenly everything he didn't want. It's his whole private world on the front pages of every newspaper and every magazine and the whole relationship completely dissected. 
Rob will be absolutely devastated by what's happened with Kristen for a number of reasons. The first is he's gone on the record himself as saying that he can't take infidelity, he doesn't understand why people are unfaithful to one another, so for that reason alone he would obviously be completely devastated. Secondly, he is quite a sensitive guy generally. Thirdly, he has wanted to be with Kristen from the moment they first met. He had to fight to win her. He did finally win her, he wooed her and he got her. Things seem to be going very well. I mean, they've been living together. They're now openly a couple. And if all that were not enough, it seems that he was on the verge of proposing to her as well. So everything has been cut from under him completely. The biggest problem, though, was actually the wronging of a much-loved Hollywood figure in Robert Patterson, someone who no one really felt deserved uh, what he had to go through because, of course, he had never really spoken about his personal life or made it a big issue, yet all of a sudden, it's dominating his career too. Rob Pattinson has an army of young female fans. You know, we saw that very famous YouTube clip of that girl, you know, hysterical, you know, Rob, Kristen, how could you do this to Rob? And it got everywhere. There's a lot of passionate young women in love with him who never thought Kristen was good enough for him in the first place. And all this has done is confirmed their um, resolve that Kristen and Rob weren't, you know, she wasn't good enough for him, Rob deserves much better. I think Kristen Stewart's got to be quite careful now, because as far as the Twilight fans are concerned, Kristen has ruined Robert's life. Um, they're going to take it all very seriously, it's going to take a very long time for them to, you know, get it all back, back together. I mean, they've got to do press together for the final film. This is not going to go away very easily, it's going to be awful to watch. I don't think her affair with Rupert Sanders will necessarily affect her career in terms of the roles she's given because what she's done there plays into the hands of the self-destructive role she really likes to take and that's what she's done. She's completely self-imploded. She had Robert Pattinson, the guy that everyone wants. She had this huge fame and she decides to have an affair with a married man. There was nothing smart about that. Now, will this hurt her career? Well, you know, she may have a hard time getting back some of those Twilight fans who are so loyal to the idea of Bella and Edward and Kristen and Rob, but eventually she's gonna overcome this and this will be a footnote in her career. Lots of stars have done much worse and they're back on top today. Robert's Hollywood stock as a result of Christian's affair with Rupert Sanders has gone through the roof because obviously there was huge sympathy for him anyway because he had to deal with this horrible personal situation and then he didn't back out of any commitments but he made it very very clear that he'd never sold his personal life and didn't intend to start now but I think for Robert it's been definitely an incredibly uncomfortable time who wants to have the entire world talking about the fact that you've been cheated on. It's particularly ironic when you're one of the most eligible bachelors in all of Hollywood to be cheated on. It's definitely not what you expect to have to deal with. The jury is still out about whether they'll be able to get over this because Kristen herself seems to have been absolutely devastated by the understanding of what she's done. Um, so I suppose it is possible, but the trouble is, is that even when two people really love one another, if one of them has a fling elsewhere, even if it is, as some people are saying, a very chaste fling, it destroys something at the fundamental heart of a relationship. I don't think it's ever going to be the same for the two of them again. While the future for Rob and Kristen as a couple remains unclear, there is no doubt that their relationship off screen is a story that captured the hearts of their adoring fans and only served to enhance their smouldering on screen romance. With rumours abound that the couple have reunited, there is still hope yet. Despite a very public affair and breakup, it seems that Rob and Kristen have managed to resolve their issues and are now back together. And while their future as a couple remains unclear, there is little doubt that we have not heard the last of Rob, Kristen and their Hollywood love story.